joining me for the next Bite of Life.com podcast. I'm your host as usual, Cam Cam. Today's podcast is going to be about the Museum of Contemporary Art in Barcelona. It's referred to as MACBA for short, but it's actually um, the Museum of Contemporary Art, like I said. And I won't bother to uh, say it in Spanish because I'm sure I wouldn't sound very good. Anyway, I'm going to try and describe to you some of the work of art that we saw at the museum. It was on our last day in the city, and I'm really glad we actually saw some of this. Contemporary art is not my favorite form of art. I much prefer impressionists like Monet and Manet, and I like art that I can actually see and understand what it is. You know, if I see a woman bathing, then I know it's a woman bathing. I don't need to see some squiggly lines or I don't like to guess too much at what the artist is thinking about when they make the work. So it was it was going to be interesting to see how I would feel about it, but I actually end up liking it. Um, they have some permanent displays at the museum it's located in the El Raval neighborhood of Ciudad Vela in Barcelona. And it's actually very cool. It's in the Plaza of Angels, it's called. It's a very modern and glass, you know, building among all this old architecture. I mean, you're looking at streets that have been there for hundreds and hundreds of years, you know, with the tiny streets where there are no cars and... Um, all the old houses with people sunning their, uh, drying their clothes outside. And then you see this huge building that's so modern and new. It was actually referred to as the Pearl when it was first built because of the way it stands out. And uh, it's quite a ju juxtaposition, but it looks, you know, it works very well. And the modern building fits in with the rest of Barcelona. If you've been to Barcelona, you see like the architecture is very unique, very modern and very out there. So this, this actually fits. The square is very popular with skateboarders and it's actually one of the very, um, one of the most used, I guess, and one of the most famous ones where the, the, the skating takes place all the time. And actually there were some, some roller skates that were decorated, that were painted inside of the museum that I enjoyed seeing. So I'm not sure if they were local artists or not. But it's a very interesting square. And uh, there are little tapas places you can just sit and uh, get something to eat or drink and people watch after you go to the museum or before you go to the museum, if you prefer. We went afterwards. And uh, we had a lovely time. The building was designed by a man by the name of um, Richard Meyer. And it was scheduled to open. It was supposed to open in time for the Olympics in 1992. But it actually didn't open until 1996 to the public. So it was a little delayed. But from what I see, it was definitely worth it. The glass is very it makes the makes the building very airy on the inside, and it, it draws light in, and it did a really good job. the The lobby itself is quite spacious. It's very open. It's like two floors, you know, and so there are like a lot of skylights, and it's all in black and white, and there are, you know seats down there, and and. Uh, bean bags that you could actually sit at while you read or while you take the load off. The, ver the first um, permanent work that was there was called Some Object of Desire. And it's been in permanent display there since 2004. It's a work, a body of work by the name, uh, by a man by the name of Lawrence Weiner, that's W-E-I-N-E-R. He was born in the Bronx in New York, actually. He's a conceptual artist. I was a little, I don't know what the word is, not disturbed, but I was a little, I felt like I was a little lost because I really didn't understand his work. 
Um, the collection is described as a mathematical equation that emphasizes the relationship between humans and physical objects. And I don't mean to be a real dumbo, but I really didn't get it. And from the looks of the people that were in our little group, I don't think anybody got it either. The, the guide, she was so sweet. She tried to explain to us that we were kind of, <laughs> we were kind of like, okay, sure, whatever. But here's the, here's the equation that's written on the giant wall just before you go in. It reads, some objects of desire plus some objects of necessity plus some objects of no concern minus those things that escape notice divided by a force majeure equals some things. And I was like, what? I mean, I don't get it. Equals some things. I guess it's telling you that maybe you can have you can't have everything like you're going to be missing something no matter what you do I don't know but it was it was it was weird um, a lot of his work seemed to me like the work of a great graphic artist if I had to describe it like maybe somebody who did really good works with uh, branding and logo it was a lot of reds and blues, and they were all like, you know, symbols and letters and things like that. It just, it didn't move me, and I just didn't get it. So maybe I'm not the right person that they're aiming for. I mean, we can all love the same art, which is what makes the world go around, I guess. There were some works by other lesser-known artists that I really enjoyed, and I think one of them, even though the colors were similar, it was reds and there was a lot of blues, but I don't think it's by the same artist. The lady said something like the collection was like two faces or something, and it was really neat. You know, it was like a portrait of a guy, of guys, like each picture was a guy, and there was the, the face that's presented to the world, like, you know, just a regular face that was smiling or not doing anything, you know, non-committal. And then you flip open the canvas and there is like this grotesque sometimes face or happy or sad. So it sort of like tells you, okay, you, you're like, this is the face you present to the, to the rest of the world. And then when you peel back all the layers, there's this person or this thing inside of you. Maybe it's anger, envy, you know, um, malicious, vicious look. And I really liked that because it was something I could see and feel and understand. It was, it was very well conveyed to the person who was seeing it because you looked at it and you saw. I saw a face of anger. I saw a face of sadness. You know, I could look at it and tell. So it wasn't something I had to, like I say, guess at, which is what a lot of the contemporary art seems to be uh, to me. So I actually enjoy that. If it's by the same artist, I am very glad. But I don't think so from what she said. I kept trying to remember. But there was so much information that was packed into the tour that it was a little hard to remember everything. The other permanent um, exhibit was called Rinzen. This was another kind of puzzling piece of artwork. It was made by a, an artist by the name of Antoni Tapies. That's T-A-P-I-E-S. And it was, it was uh, interesting in that it was, a, it was a, a gigantic piece of art that was hung up on the wall. It was a bed, like a metal bed, and it was all, it had a blanket and a pillow and the whole thing. It was a hospital bed, and next to it was a chair. And then um, on top of it, on the wall, was called, you know, it was written Rinzen, and then one, two, three. And you were made to understand that the first part was the hospital bed. The second part was actually outside on the balcony of the veranda, there was, it was next to a door and you go out and there's a series and I think it was about 12 chairs that were on the veranda and they were all kind of connected to each other 
and bolt it to the floor and they were white and white spray paint and they were connected by a black chain which I'm not sure if that was the part the, the third part was the chains or the third part was the chair that was next to the to the church it's the lady said it's it's supposed to symbolize fragility and instability and I didn't understand that part when it was presented she said it was uh, presented in 1993 I'm pretty sure she said the Bosnian war was still going on so it was easy to understand where some of the influence came from the hospital bed the people that had been hurt the fragile life so that was a little bit better than the first exhibit because I kind of understand where he was coming from I still didn't you know fully understand it but at least it made a little bit more sense in reading um, about the artist by myself like after after um, we had visited the museum it seems that it was a work that was born out of some trauma when he was a kid he had been traumatized by seeing like he went to one of those amusement fair things and there was a woman that was in a bed and basically they threw you know how they threw the the balls to the to the bullseye like to get the woman to fall I'm not sure why it traumatized him but it was something that stayed with him forever and I think that had an influence on the work from what I read by myself. So, I don't know what to make of it. But you can see the pictures on the website, which is nextbiteoflife.com. You can see the pictures that go with, along with some of this art that I'm describing to you. By far my favorite part of the tour of the museum was the section called Intangibles. This was very cool because it was like a time capsule of like 70s to 90s music and me and movies. So they had displays of like old vinyl records and uh, old VHS and DVD covers of like all those movies that were, you know, happening then. In those days, the music was very controversial and it was nice to know that I always assumed that most of the rebels, as far as music, were Americans and British people. But it was kind of nice to know that the, the Spanish were also rebels in their own way. And they actually had some of the artists that had like blonde hair and uh, that were kind of far out there. People like Pedro Almodova, who's one of my favorite filmmakers of all time. And I used to adore his movies. And I don't know if you knew that Antonio Banderas was actually one of his favorite actors from those days and I had the biggest crush on him. So his stuff was there. I discovered that he, he actually had made some music as well as movies. So that was really nice to, to hear and to see. And uh, he was his usual very colorful self, shall I say. There were listening stations, like the, the intangible section is like this room. It was uh, very dark, like all in black. And it had like black curtains all around and you go behind the curtains. And it was it felt kind of secretive and it kind of gave you the feel of like you were inside of a time capsule almost. And they had listening stations with with headphones and you could listen to some of the music. So I was there for a while. I listened to a lot of uh, rock, a lot of uh, Spanish rock, a lot of bolero music, flamenco. Um, I couldn't understand the words because most of them were in uh, in Spanish. But the music and the rhythm, I mean, you don't have to understand language to be able to feel that. And it, it just, it was wonderful. And I really enjoy that part. I, I could have stayed there all day, really, <laughs> discovering some of the music of yesteryear. And they also had, like, the British ones, of course, like the Clash and things like that. And groups like that. Apparently, in those days, it was, um, it was not unusual for the radio stations to be harassed constantly by the police. You were, the, the music was considered Maxist, and um, they, they did not want the youth exposed to that. But, you know, you can't stop progress. 
And when you look at it, looking back now, you think of all the music and how it is now. Like it's almost at the other end of the spectrum, where the music is almost too free, and there's all this sexual tension in the videos, and you know all this really explicit lyrics. And you think back then, it was just the words. It wasn't even like videos to accomplish it to to accompany them. So you think how how we've changed so far. It's almost too bad now, at least I think so. But uh, I, I enjoy that part a lot. I think if I had to say, you know, what what my favorite part of the art was, I would say that was it. And also a lot of the old um, company logos and, and uh, the skateboards that I mentioned in the beginning, those were really nice to see. They had painted... Um, they had faces painted on the bottom of the skateboard and if you look at one of the if you look at the image on the website the first one looks like Liza Minnelli and I'm not sure if it's supposed to be her or not but it just looks to me like but the colors they use are very very nice there were also old black and white photography which I absolutely loved absolutely you also saw some projected images on the wall, like they had like 20s flappers, like black and white, and you know, nude art, like projections, and you were almost mesmerized just standing there watching it. I really, I really enjoyed it. There were some permanent displays that we didn't get to see either, like there's a, there's a display that's called um, Growth and Form, and it's by an artist by the name of Richard Hamilton. It looked pretty interesting from the outside. And, you know, I saw, like, it was like a, an x-ray projection of, like, the hand, so, like, the, the bones. And I would have liked to see that, but we were running out of time, so I didn't get to actually enjoy that part of it. The um, bookstore of the museum is almost like a work of art by itself. It looks absolutely fantastic. I really loved going through it. It seemed like everything was put like just so. It almost felt like you were watching like live art. The lighting, like the mood, everything was really beautiful and it was so bright and you know, I I liked that a lot. And you almost didn't want to touch anything because it seems like, you know, you're disturbing the artwork. But it was it was nice. Um, did I enjoy my visit? Yes. Did I enjoy it as much as I loved the um, MNAC? No, I did not. I, I like that one much better. But this, you know, stands on its own as well because you can't really compare the two because you know they're not the same. They're not the same thing. Obviously, they're not the same kind of art. But I think on the whole, you would definitely enjoy this if you visit Barcelona. It's worth the $10 admission price. It might be a bit pricey, 10 euros. Sorry, 10 euros. The admission price is 10 euros. It sounds a bit pricey, but not for Barcelona. If you've gone to the Sagrada, for instance, you know it's 18 euros to get in there. And a lot of the churches along the Gothic Quarter... Uh, will charge you eight euros just to go in for a few minutes and see the church, so you get a little bigger bang for your buck with this um, with this museum, and uh, it's nice. I enjoyed myself. I would definitely visit it again because, in addition to the um, to the permanent works that they have there, they also have rotating exhibits. And there's actually one there right now. I think it's called like a, the dwarf and the hippo, which which sounds, which sounds it sounds funny, uh, and it sounds great, and it sounds like something I would like to see. I probably wouldn't go to the uh, winer and the tapes section again if I went back, but I would see other works that they had because I, I found it really interesting and really fun. The museum is located, like I said, in the El Raval neighborhood. And the museum hours, they open Monday through Friday from 11 to 8. Saturdays from 10 to 8. Sundays and holidays, they open 10 to 3. And they close on Tuesdays, except for public holidays when they open from 10 to 3. 
I think if you're in Barcelona and you like contemporary art, this is definitely a place that you should visit. It's, it's worth it. And I felt like a little bit, I felt a little bit stupid, I guess, maybe, for not getting the, the, the works of uh, Mr. Weiner, especially. But I won't feel so bad because I know that my art, the art that I like, is, is pretty good. And uh, I enjoy that. I thank you very much for joining me for this episode of nextbiteoflife.com podcast. I love bringing it to you and I hope you enjoy listening to them as well and that you continue to come back. If you think I'm missing something about this art and you think that you can enlighten me, I would love to hear from you. Um, the handle on Twitter is at Next Bite of Life. On Facebook, it's next, nextbiteoflife.com. Oh, sorry. Next, it's facebook.com, Next Bite of Life. I would love for you to like our page or listen to us or check out some of the other posts that we have. Sometimes we have little goodies on, on um, Facebook that's done on the website, just little posts here and there. But it's been great being with you today, and I hope you go to the, to the website and check out the images. There's quite a lot of them that go along with this podcast. Thank you for listening, and I hope you have a good day.